Welcome back to the program. You're listening to Business in Vancouver on Roundhouse Radio 98.3 with a daily business program from the Business in Vancouver newspaper and the website, BIV.com. I'm Kirk LaPointe. I'm Haley Wooden. A lot of Canada's concerns regarding NAFTA have understandably focused on Canada's trade relationship with the United States. But at stake too, of course, is a favorable trade arrangement with Canada and Mexico. And our next guest joins us today with insight into this. Ambassador Andres Rosenthal is a career diplomat of more than 35 years. He served as Mexico's ambassador to Sweden, the United Kingdom, and the UN. He was Mexico's deputy foreign minister from 88 to 94. He's also the president of consulting firm Rosenthal and Asociados and holds the lifetime rank of eminent ambassador of Mexico. Now, Ambassador Rosenthal is in Vancouver this week for a number of events, including one with former Quebec Premier Jean Charest, where he will share Mexico's perspective on NAFTA's renegotiation and talk a little bit about how the renegotiation process has impacted Canada-Mexico relations. Thank you very much for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having me. Has being brought back into the NAFTA stew affected Canada-Mexico relationships? Positively, actually. I think we are probably today much closer uh, together politically on the NAFTA discussions than we were before Mr. Trump arrived and decided that he didn't like NAFTA. Are we weathering the storm together? Is that the way it's working? We are. We are. And uh, fortunately, the Trudeau government has uh, made it a point of insisting that this is a trilateral negotiation and that therefore we are three at the table. And of the three, Canada and Mexico are on the same page in most all of the issues that are being discussed. Um, There are some where we have different views. Uh, I think, you know, Canada's put on the table issues relating to gender and indigenous people's rights and so on. I think those are more important to Canada. In the settlement of disputes, there are some issues which Canada favors more than we do. But by and large, as was the case 25 years ago when we started the NAFTA negotiations, we are much closer together vis-a-vis the U.S. uh, than ever before. With both countries trying to stick together and negotiate as a team when negotiating with the U.S., do you think that will help Canada and Mexico gain a, a more favorable outcome of NAFTA, or is it hard to say at this point? I have no doubt uh, that that's the case. Uh, I think that being together strengthens each one of us uh, much more than if we were to go uh, individually. Uh, the uh, The Americans have different issues with uh, us in some cases, but in others, like the automotive sector, we're mm-hmm. exactly on the same page. And I think that working together and having a common strategy uh, has been much more beneficial to both of us than if uh, we had listened to some of the voices that would prefer a bilateral negotiation. Of course, Donald Trump very early on um, told the American people that trade deals in general, NAFTA included, have been bad for America. Has this deal been bad for anybody? It's been a win-win-win. Um, and I think that it's been a win-win-win in case in all three cases. I think for Mexico, probably more than maybe Canada or the U.S., uh, but it certainly has been between Canada and Mexico. Our trading and investment relationship has grown 20-fold. Uh, there's no question that it's been good for both of us, but it's also been good for the U.S., I mean, we're talking about a major, major trading relationship and investment relationship in North America, which benefits the U.S. Eight million jobs uh, were created over these years, uh, which are a direct result of the value chains and the integration of North America. We have now a quarter century of history involving this. What is What do you now look back on as the uh, characteristics of NAFTA in terms of enhancing prosperity in Mexico and perhaps political stability as part of it? I think there are, there are several uh, parts to that question. I would, as uh, you know, some people expected that uh, it would automatically bring Mexico out of uh, development status and make it a developed economy. That hasn't happened. Uh, But it certainly has uh, strengthened the Mexican economy from the point of view of moving us from a commodities-dependent economy into a manufacturing economy, highly sophisticated, 
uh, highly integrated with the U.S. and with Canada, uh, and it has certainly strengthened democracy and civil society in Mexico. I think those are issues which NAFTA brought uh, and which we consider in Mexico as, as extremely valuable um, in terms of how things have developed. On the other hand, uh, it's true, uh, and I think one has to admit that uh, NAFTA did not achieve an objective that some people put on it, uh, not everybody, but some people, uh, that it would, uh, it would sort of overnight uh, bring Mexico's wage structure and uh, prosperity up to the same levels as the U.S. and Canada. Sure. When it comes to Mexican industry, what are some of their concerns? And is it in line with, say, the Mex Mexican populace in terms of what their thoughts are about what NAFTA has been able to achieve in Mexico? Uh, from the industrial point of view and from the private sector point of view in general, I think uh, NAFTA has a, a very concrete uh, position in terms of how the Mexican private sector operates. Uh, today, uh, the integration, the fact that there are many Mexican companies that are in the U.S. and in Canada, uh, Canada Bread, for example, among right, others, yeah. Uh, gives uh, a, a clear picture of a, an economy and a private sector that looks at its future and its strategy within a North American context, mm. uh, much more than just a bilateral one. Uh, and this is especially true between Mexico and the U.S., but increasingly with Canada as well. And Canadian companies, uh, in turn, doing the same thing as far as their presence in Mexico, especially the mining sector and other parts of the economy. Yeah, it's it's worth uh, focusing a little bit on that uh, in our discussion, because I think uh, we've we've been accustomed to talking about what America is looking for from Canada. We, of course, have heard about what America continues to look for from Mexico, but we don't talk very much about what Canada is looking for from Mexico and vice versa. What What are the issues, do you think, at the table between our two countries that uh, that you know they perhaps aren't hogging the limelight in the way that right. what America is looking for. I think the one issue which is probably most interesting and most uh, novel is the energy sector. Okay. Given that Mexico uh, changed its constitutional impediment for private sector participation in the energy sector uh, earlier during the Peña Nieto administration. That has opened the door for an enormous interest within Canada in the energy sector. Um, most of uh, Canadian, important Canadian energy companies are in Mexico or are beginning to operate in Mexico. They have been involved mainly in the infrastructure sector, pipelines and other things, which previously they, they did not do. In the case of the mining sector, which is an important one here in Vancouver, mm -hmm. Uh, given that most of the mining companies have their headquarters here, um, there's been also a very important increase in uh, in Canadian mining activity in Mexico. Not exempt, by the way, from some problems, but uh, important in terms of the presence. Um, the other the other issues which we are very closely tied on is the automotive sector. There have been lots of um, uh, complaints here in Canada that the automotive sector is gradually disappearing and going to Mexico. Uh, I've seen lots of uh, analysis about that. Um, I think the Canadian um, uh, government and the Canadian private sector understand that because it's a highly integrated uh, sector, that uh, if some jobs in the final assembly process that used to be in Canada or now in Mexico. At the same time, we have an enormous presence of Canadian uh, suppliers present in Mexico in tier two, tier three suppliers to the automotive sector. So today, you know, cars and trucks are not Mexican or American or Canadian. They are North American. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that has been beneficial for the consumer. It has meant that people pay less for their cars than they would have paid if they had remained in Canada or in the U.S. So there, there are lots of things, I think, within the Canadian-Mexican relationship on, in, in economic terms 
that are that are important and then there's the services sector which is one in which we have the presence of uh, scotia bank and a lot of canadian service companies financial and otherwise that are increasing uh, by leaps and bounds their presence in mexico i would like to see more presence of mexican uh, business in the in canada um you know the, the bimbo's purchase of canada bread was great and, yeah, yeah. And big and everything but that's just one mm-hmm. one thing in which we could probably be much more active uh, and present we're speaking to ambassador andreas rosenthal of course nafta is consuming a lot of the discussion when it comes to trade between these three parties but what do you think would facilitate greater investment between canada and mexico and greater business and economic ties Well, I think the first thing is we need to get rid of the uncertainty uh, surrounding NAFTA. I mean, right now, as you saw last week, for example, the mere rumor that maybe Mr. Trump was going to throw NAFTA under the bus uh, hit the Canadian dollar, the Mexican peso. Um, Investors don't like uncertainty. They would like to see this thing put to rest. And I think that once it is, and I do think it will be, I don't think we'll lose NAFTA. I think NAFTA will go forward. Um, once that uncertainty disappears, there are enormous uh, opportunities for continued presence uh, and and new things. So I'm hopeful that that will that will be what will what will be happening this year and next year, because uh, as long as we have this sort of Damocles hanging over us, that maybe Mr. Trump is going to throw it away or not throw it away and so on, that complicates uh, the relationship. How is it also complicating the forthcoming election campaign in Mexico? There was, of course, an initial understanding that all of this would be signed, sealed, and offered forward by the time the election was going to come along. That's obviously not going to happen. It was totally unrealistic from the beginning to think that. Well, there are many unrealistic things that have been uttered from Washington lately, so we we don't need to necessarily single that one out. Agree. uh, But um, but, so how is it intersecting with the campaign, do you think? Are the Mexican people now going to be um, essentially keeping their resolve around the president in order to get the best possible deal and wanting continuity? at the table? What do you think it's going to do? I'd begin by saying one, one thing which I, I'm very positive about, and that is 25, 23 years ago when we signed and ratified NAFTA, the uh, constituency that had been built up in favor of NAFTA in the U.S., in Canada, and in Mexico disappeared overnight. Everybody took it for granted. It was there. Now let's go on with our business. And there was no NAFTA constituency in any of our three countries until Mr. Trump arrived on the scene. And the fact that he has put the whole issue uh, under this cloud of uncertainty has led to a NAFTA constituency in all three countries growing again. And that coalition in the case of the U.S. and that constituency is the one that I think has been the most um, vociferous and the most effective in pushing Mr. Trump away from his initial idea of doing with NAFTA what he did for TPP and what he did for Paris climate and other things. So I think on that, on that, uh, it's 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 a clear win. On the other hand, uh, I think that in the Mexican election campaign, which hasn't really started yet. Yeah. Um, this issue will probably not figure very prominently. Oh. I think most uh, Mexicans are looking at other issues, uh, domestic issues, corruption, impunity, uh, human rights issues, things that we are very worried about because over these last few years, because we are neighbors to this insatiable consuming country <laughs> of drugs and other illicit things, uh, we have uh, a serious problem. Mm. And I think that uh, this uh, this is probably what the Mexican voter and the average Mexican is most interested in uh, when it comes to the political campaigns, which will only really formally start in March. Yes. So uh, unless, of course, NAFTA is uh, gone uh, for some reason before then, uh, then maybe it will figure uh, otherwise, I would say that most my my basic scenario is NAFTA negotiations are going to go on the rest of this year, 
um, and um, on a technical basis, and they will start looking at some of the big political issues like rules of origin, dispute settlement, sunset clause, etc. Um, but I don't think that at this point there is that much difference in how the three major presidential candidates are looking at the issue of NAFTA. We all see that NAFTA is beneficial for Mexico. So it'll get past your election, the midterms, it'll be in our nest. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, you know, trade, trade is always highly sensitive politically. It was highly sensitive when we did NAFTA here in Canada. I spent a lot of my time as a younger person running around different parts of Canada trying to convince Canadians, um, both politicians and business people, that NAFTA would be good for Canada. And I think it has been good for Canada. But it's highly sensitive politically. And uh, we see this in the U.S. all the time, and we'll see it in Mexico. NAFTA passed the U.S. Congress by a very, very thin margin back 25 years ago. Um, I don't know. We'll see what kind of a Congress the U.S. comes up with this time. Uh, Mexican Congress also different. Uh, back then, President Salinas had a, not a majority, but he had a more comfortable uh, legislature, and he was able to pass NAFTA without that much uh, discussion or debate. Today, uh, the country is more polarized politically, and uh, depending on who wins the election, we'll have to see if we have a, a populist on the left who is running, Mr. Lopez Obrador, and um, he's on record as saying that he doesn't like NAFTA, uh, that he thinks that NAFTA has been very good for the U.S. and very bad for Mexico. So Mr. Trump thinks it's been very good for Mexico and very bad for the U.S. So you have a populist on the right in Washington and a populist on the left maybe in Mexico. And that'll be interesting to see how that develops. But um, depending on who wins the election, I think uh, we'll have to see where, where this goes. Ambassador Rosenthal, we really appreciate you joining us on the show. Thanks so much for coming on the program. My pleasure. That's Ambassador Andres Rosenthal. He's the eminent ambassador of Mexico, the country's former deputy foreign minister, and a career diplomat of more than 35 years. You're listening to Business in Vancouver on Roundhouse Radio 98.3. I'm Haley Wooden. And I'm Kirk LaPointe. Stay with us.